All right, everybody, we're going to get things started. Um, so it sounds like people can hear me, but if anybody's not hearing me, I guess they don't notice anything. But if, if you have any sound issues at any point, please let me know in the chat. Um, we're going to uh, predominantly have people muted. We might open it up uh, to question and answer at the end, but people mostly are going to be muted. So if you have any question, please, uh, questions, please put them in the chat in uh, the lower left-hand corner. Um, thank you for everybody for coming uh, to this, our second of uh, annual report um, webinar. Um, and yeah, so I know that we know that the annual report is by and large not everyone's favorite thing, and we really appreciate how much work uh, all of you have to put into it, um, time that you uh, time that could be spent on who knows how many other things, but we really appreciate that you do it. So um, anything that we can do to try to make it an easier, smoother, quicker process, we would love to do. Uh, so thanks for coming today. Um, all right, so we're going to, this uh, session is going to kind of bounce between um, a PowerPoint and um, some online stuff where we just go through the report. So we're going to start with the PowerPoint. And PowerPoint is working on it. And da, 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 da. OK. Um, all right, so hopefully everybody can see the PowerPoint right now. If anybody can't see the PowerPoint, please let me know. And the PowerPoint, uh, yeah, well, so we're going to move away from that. But, I mean, eventually. Okay, so here is a session. So, what is the annual report? Um, the annual report is basically a statistical overview of what every library is doing, has done during the last year. Um, it tries to get at basically uh, everything that you can get statistically uh, easily. So. Um, all of your holdings, all of your CERC numbers, all of your um, programming numbers, and then all the financials that are coming into and out of the building. Uh, that's what we're aiming to capture. So how do questions get on the annual report? Uh, the per most of the questions are determined by IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services. But they get input from the 50 state data co coordinators, which are just basically the the people who field the in report. So I'm a state data coordinator at the moment for uh, Vermont. And each time that they want to add a new question or change a question, it, they put it to a vote. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later because there is a new question coming this year. So uh, additionally, there are some questions that uh, the state of Vermont uh, that we have added on our own. And so those are ones that IMLS doesn't ask, but that we think are important to capture. So that's why we have added them. Um, I, should point out quickly, um, I forgot to mention this, we are recording this session, so um, please be aware of that. Um, and we'll be putting it on uh, YouTube after after we're done. So if you miss anything, or if you have to hop out partway through, or if you know somebody else who might be interested, this whole thing should be up there. Um, and like I said, probably in the next day or two, we'll get up, up there. So that is, what is the end report? Okay. Also, um, questions. When, if you have questions, feel free to either put them in whenever you want, and we'll do them as soon as we can kind of float them in. If it's an immediate thing, we'll jump to it. If, um, if it seems like we're going to cover it later, I'll try to hold off on that. But feel free to just, if you have a question at any point, throw it into the chat, and we will get to it if we can. I should also admit that there's a good chance you're going to have a question that I'm not going to be able to answer immediately. Um, we had quite a few of those last session. There, can to, tend to be some sort of outlier cases and nitty gritty issues that we kind of have to think about and see what IMLS is really looking for. So if you have a hard question, I may get back to you in a few days. But um, yeah, so that's basically the short version of what the annual report is. Who uses the info in the annual report? So first off, the primary, the, the first user is IMLS. IMLS is the one who, uh, who we're basically required to submit to the report to. It's sort of their, their report in a sense. So they're the first users. They use it 
both to show how libraries are doing throughout the country, things that are growing or shrinking or what have you, and, and to show, make a case for the significance of libraries, but also to kind of adjust funding in that they're a significant funding source for all the state agencies, um, all state library agencies. Who else uses it? The federal government uses it in the same way. They can see how libraries are doing and figure out how significant libraries are uh, a part, as a part of life. Um, additionally, other state and public libraries throughout the country use it to compare themselves to other libraries that are the same size. Um, and that's, uh, we're pretty helpful in that respect because, you know, because uh, we have a lot of small libraries, we have a lot of rural libraries, and there are other states that are in the same boat. Um, but then there are other states who are not helpful for that at all. So uh, that's who uses the report on the national level. On the state level, we use it, obviously, to, um, to figure out how things are doing and to kind of figure out where funding priorities are. Uh, state government does the same thing to figure out what funding should look like each year. We uh, look at the stats that we give them, which is uh, significantly comes from the annual report. And then locally, um, it's uh, useful to each individual library because, A, it gives them a chance. And in many cases, the information that shows up in the annual report is stuff that everyone is already capturing, or much of it is stuff that you're already capturing. But it's, it just makes sure that you have it. And it also gives the opportunity to compare yourself to different people around the state and around the country who have you know, similar, similar budgets, similar population sizes, similar CERC numbers, and you can kind of get a feel for what other people are looking at. And then lastly, um, members of the public can also use the report to kind of look at their own libraries compared to other libraries and so on. So it gets used by a lot of folks, uh, potentially. All right, so this is the first important part. When is the report due? And this, can, this shifts a little bit each year. So this coming year, first off, the report is due every year. It'd be great if it wasn't, but um, it is an annual report. Um, it's the name, I suppose. Um, so the first, so the due, uh, it's going to, sorry, the, the report is going to become available November 1st. You can start working on November 1st. Um, the due date for this year is December 31st. Um, and I know that's not a great time, uh, and I appreciate that, that we, we originally had it scheduled earlier in December before, so we would miss the holidays, but then um, it was just not working. I, I'm actually going to the State Data Coordinator Conference the week before, and if I'm not here to answer questions, I feel like that could be problematic. So um, you can obviously do it anytime um, until between November 1st and December 31st, but December 31st is our due date. However, if you'd like an extension, we'll give an automatic extension if you ask to January 14th. Um, that is our, gonna be our hard deadline, January 14th this time around. So if anybody has questions about that or anything else at any point um, uh, after this, or um, Get in touch with me. The, about a third of this um, webinar is if you have a question, ask Josh. And even if you have a minor question or if you've been wrestling with something for a little while, just ask me. Don't hesitate at all, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Uh, so that's when the report is due. Um, OK, so important uh, issue number two. And this is more complicated than it seems. What time period does the report cover? So this part is confusing, um, and I, because it's set up in a confusing way, not because anybody doesn't get it, but it is, it is confusing. Um, so individual libraries in Vermont, um, because everybody's sort of independent, there is not this overarching group, there aren't county organizations and so on. So individual libraries use a whole bunch of different fiscal years um, for, for their in, in, internal structuring. For example, uh, a lot of libraries use a calendar year. Calendar year, January 1st, December 31st. That's popular. The traditional fiscal year, which is July 1st to June, June 30th of the next year, also quite popular. A few libraries use the federal fiscal year, which is October 1st to September 30th of the next year. And then some libraries use other things. Um, in general, I think libraries either use what they've always used or they use whatever their municipality uses. So. Um, so throughout the state, people will use any of the above. And that's where the complication comes. Um, so the way that IMLS has structured this is they want you to submit your last fiscal year that ended, has ended by October 15th. So that means if you use traditional fiscal year, July to June of the next year, or, tradition, or federal fiscal year, October to September of the next year, you just give us the last thing that you have. So you, you submit the year, the current year. 
And so that's fairly straightforward and, and intuitive. However, if you follow the calendar year, the January to December, that ends after October 15th. So we want you to submit, or to put it another way, MLS wants you to submit last year's data, which is not intuitive at all, and is where things get challenging. Um, so what they would like is, in this case, they want you to submit 2017 data. And that's the thing that, um, you know, everybody works on the report once a year, so that's the thing that whenever you do something once a year, you kind of forget parts in between. I know I do. So, and so often we have, you know, there's turn, director turnover, the report is never the first thing on people's minds when they get turned over, uh, when they uh, transition to a new, uh, a new director or what have you. So that's the confusing piece. If you use the calendar year, we want you, you should be submitting last year's data. Um, as a caveat to that, there are a few libraries who are off schedule currently um, because they have, because somewhere along the line that got, um, that got off and now they're, they're giving us um, the, the, the data. They have followed the calendar year, but they have given us the current year and not the previous year data. I will get in touch with everybody who's in that camp and basically what we're probably gonna do is just keep doing what we're doing for the time being and we will fix it at some point in the future. So um, yeah, so that's it. Basically, if you don't have a calendar year, this is pretty straightforward. If you do have a calendar year, um, you should be giving us last year's data unless they get in touch with you because we need to figure out um, that you're, you've been doing a little bit off. And it's not the end of the world, we just have tried to make it as consistent as possible. So that is confusing thing number one. We've made it through. Okay, what's new this coming year? There are a few medium, uh, on the sort of medium minor things that are changing. The first thing that's changing is we're gonna be using a new portal. Everyone, is, um, everyone who does the annual report um, logs into a portal that is um, uh, run, uh, Baker and Taylor is the vendor. They go in, everybody has a, their own login and password. They go in, enter your own data in the portal. Baker and Taylor is changing the way the portal looks this year. It, by and large, everything is still there. It just might be in a different spot slightly. Um, the colors are a little different, but by and large, it is basically the same thing. I'm going to show you what it looks like real quick. So I'm going to share my screen. Usernames and passwords will be the same as last year. But if you ever have a question about what your username or password is, just get in touch with me. I have them all on the spreadsheet, and I can pass them out without any trouble. OK, so this is basically what the new portal is going to look like. It's basically all the same information. Things are just in slightly different areas. Um, in terms of uh, data that's in it, all the data that there's a button that you can show last year's answers that'll still be in there, and that'll still have all your data from previous years. So um, once it's live, you'll be able to do that. Like I said, everything is is it's the same. It's just moved around a little bit. Um, as we get closer, once it's actually live, we're going to do a, a brief little either 
a, an email or a tiny little webinar or something to just walk people through the new site. But I just wanted people to know that the new site is going to be um, up and running when we're, when we're doing this. OK, so let me get back to you. There we go. Okay, so I want to switch back to the and back to the report in a second. Okay, good. Right. So, so that's thing number one. It's going to look different. Mostly function the same, but it's going to look different. Thing number two. There are changes to some questions. Um, first off. Uh, previously, under holdings, this is not under circulation, but under holdings, um, in, uh, items that were listed in Upper Vermont or RB Digital were, in, were not necessarily included under ebooks and audiobooks. They were maybe included under a database. There was a question about whether it was in your catalog or not, and we're just going to change that. All your listed in Vermont and RB Digital items are going to go under ebooks and audiobook holdings. So. Um, what that means, RB Digital, you should already be getting an email that tells you what it, uh, what your holdings are. Um, Listen Up Vermont, we're going to work with, um, if you don't already get that information, if you don't know how to get any stats for Listen Up Vermont uh, slash overdrive, uh, talk to us and we'll talk to GMLC and we'll get that all figured out. But basically, in previous years, that wasn't necessarily getting in there and it was undercounting what people had. And I don't know, we wanted to fix that so that it also, the question was worded a really confusing way. So that's thing number one. Thing number two is there is a new question, and that is um, IMLS has added a new question. There was a vote, and uh, it passed. And the new question is, how many visits um, uh, have you had to your library website over the year? And um, when IMLS adds questions, they start it sort of as kind of a pilot program. So we're acting the same way. We know that we're not going to get that staff from everybody. We, it's going to be a work in progress. This is just going to be the first year. People who can do it are going to do it. People who are not quite sure how to do it will, will continue to work on it. But um, what they're looking for is how many visits you've had over the year to your library website. Um, OK, thing number, uh, the next thing that's changed, uh, we've changed a few questions that were listed as being per week are now per year to try to be consistent, because most of the questions were per year questions, but there were a few per week questions. So we try to move things to per year. And then uh, last, we try to simplify the language. Um, the, the instructions and the, the report in general hasn't been significantly changed in a few years, and some of the language is a little bit complicated. So we're trying to simplify it. That's going to be a work in progress over the next few years. But in any case, that's, that's where we are. So we've had a few uh, minor changes on that front. OK, uh, I think I covered most of this already. But basics of the report, if you don't have your login information, get in touch with me. Um, once you're logged in, you can work on the report in any order. You don't need to follow the order of the report. Whatever works best for you is fine. You can always stop and come back to the report. You don't need to do it in one giant, horrible sitting. You can um, you can break it out. You can do it, you know, work on it half an hour each day for a while. But I know that you guys have a ton of uh, uh, time pressures always. So, I, and I know this is a pain, but whatever time frame works best for you folks, is works fine. Just make sure you click save when you're um, done each time, and that'll definitely make sure that it's still in there, and you should be good to go. Um, I mentioned before, there's a button that says show last year's answers in the upper right hand corner. I, I leave that on all the time whenever I'm working in another in an individual libraries thing, just because it, so it lets you know what you submitted last year, um, and it sort of gives you context. So you know if something, if it's like way off, you're like, okay, maybe I did something weird, or if you're not sure how an answer gets structured, you can see how it was listed last year. I find it's, it's generally just really useful. Additionally, there is a question mark icon next to each question. If you click that, a little pop box pops up, and it gives you what, uh, our instructions. And it just says a little more information on how to answer a question. So frequently, that will, you know, sometimes that will be useful to answer your question. Sometimes there's still not enough there, and you still might have a question, in which case you should get in touch with me. Uh, I just want to reiterate, if, you, if you're hitting against something and it's not working or you're not sure how to do it, do not, like, don't be a, don't be a trooper and just try to, like, keep hitting your head against the wall on your own. Don't hesitate to get in touch with me anytime if you have questions about the report. I don't want you to be, like, 
If you call and say, oh, I spent the last two hours on a question, I'm going to feel super bad. So I would much rather you try to get a hold of me, either email or phone or whatever works, uh, sooner rather than later, if you run into any issues with the report. And it doesn't mean I'm going to know the answer, because it, often I don't, but we will be able to figure out what the answer should be. Yeah, so that's the basics of the report. Um, OK, so there are um, a series of sections of the report. Um, which we're just going to march our way through. This is this is the summary. There are a couple of things at the end as well that are basically finishing up steps. Steps, but that is um, that, and we're just going to like jump through it right now. So um, I'm going to do it where I'm going to share my screen so you get a little bit of a better view of um, what these sections look like. I'm going to use the unfortunately I'm going to use the old portal because the new portal doesn't isn't it's a testing and it isn't quite working yet. So I'm still going to be using the old portal to march through all the sections. Um, know that everything, again, is basically structured similarly, but, um, uh, but looks a little bit different. Oh, before I jump into that, does anybody have any questions yet? I, I'm sort of um, kind of fire hosing information that I do right now, and I, uh, and I hope I'm not going too fast. But if anybody has questions before we jump into the report itself, Please feel free to pop them up. Um, let's see. Um, otherwise, OK, I'm just going to start uh, jumping through the report. And um, so some parts are harder and easier, but we'll start off. OK, so first one is directory information. At the beginning of directory information, there are these, um, these fields that have a sort of gray background. Those are your, basically your contact information. Those should already be filled in, and they should already be right. If they're wrong, please let us know and we can change it. They're, they're kind of set up in a way where you're, um, you guys don't need to change them. But if, if like your, um, you know, uh, your address has changed, or in fact your fiscal boot or something like that, um, just let us know. After that, it's um, a lot of nitty gritty stuff. Um, you know, fax number, current librarian. Um, this is the one spot where it says current librarian and current president of the library board. They mean as of the day you were filling out the form. This is like basically the only place in the report where it wants to know what's happening right, 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 right now. Everything else covers the period you're speaking about, but just those. So it's a lot of contact information. You, you're, um, the director, the uh, president of the trustees, um, it asks a question about your hours after that. Um, I tried to re kind of reconstruct this a little bit so it's hopefully more coherent. It was only, the, the hours question was only confusing if you have reduced hours during either the summer or the winter or whenever you have reduced hours. Um, and it was it just it was a little contorted, so we tried to make it more clear. But it's basically, you just write down how many hours you have, and ultimately we'll, it'll figure out how many hours you were open during the year, more or less. Um, for these, you don't need to worry about, um, you know, if you're closed for, these are like regular closings we're talking about here. It's not. Don't worry about holidays. If you're like closed a week because you're renovating, someone like that, don't even worry about that. Just worry about for if, if for like a season, for like two months, you're changing your hours, or three months, or four months, or what have you. So that's part one of um, the uh, uh, directory section. Part two is super short. Part two is um, what period are you covering? And we already talked about that before, but basically it's whatever your fiscal year is. Um, and Again, any question on that front, you should get in touch with me. And then lastly, population of your service area, we're going to be entering that based on the most recent census estimates. So you don't need to worry about that one. So that is directory. That one's pretty straightforward. All right, staffing. So staffing is um, basically a question of whether you have paid staff, and then how many hours, um, how many weekly hours a um, Librarian with an MLS has, if you have anybody who fits that description. Library Librarians without an MLS. And then weekly staff for everybody else. Um, so it's fairly straightforward. Um, but yeah, those are that's the breakdown. It's um, folks, uh, librarians with an MLS, category one. Librarians without an MLS, category two. And then everyone else, um, frontline staff. Etc. Um, and so on. Um, so there's also it asks if you have anybody who is paid with 
AmeriCorps funds or grant funds or something like that. And then it also lastly asks how many volunteer hours you have. Um, and that's, um, that gives a picture of all of your staffing um, through, the, through the whole year. Um, if any, one question we got last time is if um, folks have a, have a public library certificate through the Department of Libraries, what group do they go in? Um, at the moment, they go in the uh, non-MLS category. We, we might add, uh, the department might add a uh, um, question about that uh, down the line, because it would be a nice thing to track, which we haven't tracked yet. But at the moment, this year, around this year, you just consider the main non-MLS library staff member. Okay, any questions about staffing or directory? Those are relatively straightforward. You know, one more straightforward one, and then let's get a little more involved. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, next question is space. This one's easy. What is the current square footage of your building? So, that should be filled in already. If, however, it's either wrong, which I wouldn't be surprised if there's a couple of those in there, or it's uh, you guys changed, you've got an expansion, you've moved, what have you. If, if the number here is wrong, just let us know. We will fix it. And then we'll go ahead. Um, so, that's, that's it for space. Okay. Operating income by source. Uh, this is um, there's two financial categories. This is the first of the two financial categories. Um, by and large, so if um, you may have this information at all already, if you don't, the people that you want to talk to is the treasurer on your um, of your trustees, who are serving as treasurer, and then if you're a municipal library, uh, whoever does the finances for the municipality should have these numbers as well. Um, so between them, you should be able to figure out what you need. If you're having trouble doing any of that, definitely get in touch with me. Um, so operating income covers the great majority of income that is coming into the library. There are a few exceptions that don't go in here, but by and large, most everything um, that, you're, that is coming into the library is coming into income. The first one is local tax support. So this is every town um, that is giving you tax support into your budget. Um, so some people, a lot of people have one. Some places have more than one, but some libraries um, don't have any. So if you need an additional one, you just say, add another group, write it in there. Um, so that's that. Uh, it's, um, that's starting point for this. So we want to get to all of your local tax support. Now, uh, now we get a little more complicated, uh, or not complicated, but we start into getting into some of the smaller categories. First off, non-resident borrower fees. Um, this one uh, is, seems a little bit involved, but we basically we're just asking if you charge non-resident borrower fees and then how much you make during the year based on that. I think it's something that we try to keep a handle on what how many people do it and what kind of income we're talking on, on that. So you want to um, it, it wants to know how much you charge per or, or family, and then how much you are uh, making an income over the year. Next is a pretty big category, all other income, which, um, yeah, that's that's sort of everything else um, that is not coming from a town. Um, there are uh, all the local income, I'm sorry, because we'll get the grants. Uh, that includes, as it describes, private support, gifts, fines, fees, fundraising activities, book sales, etc. It does not include in-kind, um, we'll talk about in-kind in a minute, or other non-monetary contributions. But in general, most everything else goes there. The one exception, and this is the thing we're sort of working on, is if you're getting um, gifts that are restricted, um, or restricted donations. Um, for the time being, it looks like there's some dis discrepancy over what people are looking for, MLS and such. But if you have, um, in general, um, Leave for, if there's restricted gifts, i.e. gifts that are um, added but are not going in the general fund but are for a very specific item, um, you should leave those out. But if you have a question about that, get in touch with me. Most people, it's not a thing that people have a ton of, but if you do, um, give me a holler and we can figure it out. Um, transfers. Transfers are um, money that you are taking out of an endowment, a savings account, trust fund, anything like that that's coming out of that and that it's being used basically to pay normal library expenses. So if you have anything that fits that bill, and again, that's a thing that varies dramatically between libraries, but if you do, that uh, that goes into transfer. 
transfers this question that IMLS doesn't ask, but what we'd like to know because it gives a, um, it, over, over the time, it gives a, a sort of uh, important handle on uh, Lumber's finances. Okay, so we're continuing to march our way through operating income. Next is grants. Um, and uh, I would understand if you would say, why are you asking about grants? Because in most cases, you, the grants came through us. Um, why do we have to ask? But unfortunately, because of the way that it's structured, we just, it's a lot easier. We get better answers if you guys can self-report rather than if we break down what has gone where. Um, and I know that's a pain, but we appreciate it. So basically, the questions ask all of the normal grants um, that you will be getting, um, summer reading program, um, et cetera, uh, career grants, things like that are listed. So if you're getting that, you just tell us what you're getting from that. Um, and uh, from there, so that's basically, it starts with the ones that you libraries and state are regularly getting. Then we have, if you're getting any other federal grants, um, and there's a variety that you could be involved in, but those don't necessarily go through us, please write those down as well. Next, if you ever have an, a question about what your grant situation was, you can always uh, give us a holler and we can um, get that figured out. Okay, next is private grants. Um, any grants that are not federal go into this category. It, gives, it lists a few that are sort of regular ones that people get on a semi-regular basis. Uh, but anything that is a grant that you've gotten, um, this is where it goes. So that's that. OK, next. So that is grants. and we'll rush through a number of categories of grants. In-kind support. So this one is um, can be a little bit confusing. In-kind support is basically anything that um, that an organization or person is giving you um, that is not money, but it can either be a service, a good or service that they or someone is giving you that has value. So the the first ones, the, mo the most frequent ones, are things like snow plowing or land, um, you know, landscaping, things like that that are happening. And this includes if, um, and this was a question last month. If the municip your municipality, if you're a municipal library, and a mis mis the municipality, I to say that too many times, um, is, um, it does services for you like that, building services or snow plow or landscaping, uh, landscaping, things like that, that are not included in your budget, they are in kind support, um, which I know is a little bit complicated to figure out and then put a monetary amount in, but that's what we're looking for there is Everything that the town does for you that is not budgeted, we want to know what support you're receiving. Um, if uh, somebody outside of the town is doing your snow plowing, that's, we want to know that too. We just want to know any, any support that you're receiving that is in, in kind, um, sort of structurally. Additionally, um, this also lists things like IT repair, marketing, things like that. If you have someone who is giving you um, uh, is helping you with, with something, IT, or something like that, and you're not paying them, um, they might be under any kind of support. The line, to some degree, is, is, a, is a slightly nebulous one, but it's basically, are they doing a job that they normally get paid to do? Um, so a normal, if somebody show, shelving books, things like that, it's not a job that they normally get paid to do, typically. Um, so we don't think of that as any kind of support. We think of it as just sort of into the, the bucket, normal volunteering. But if somebody does something like they're an IT person, or they do marketing, or they do have done some design for you, or consulting, or something like that, and they're doing it for free, um, that would count as in-kind support. Uh, it's all, another sort of metric to look at it is, is it a thing that you, if you said this person didn't volunteer to do this, or didn't didn't come to you, that you would have ended up paying for? If it's something you were going to pay for, would have paid for, or that you would normally pay for, that makes it in-kind support. If it's what we think of as normal day-to-day -day volunteer things, that doesn't count as in-kind support. Um, again, if you have any questions about in, what is in-kind support and how do I figure this out, because in many cases there's not a price affiliated with it, ask me, um, or, or you can always, another option is you can always ask the listener, but feel free to get in touch with me at any point and we'll figure that out. Okay, so that is in-kind support. And we are done with Operating income. Does anybody have questions about operating income? Anything that we did not cover? 
Uh, if you if you think of questions after this is through, please um, feel free to email me, as, uh, and we'll we'll get back with you as well. And uh, we'll try to broadcast it to everybody who came to this if we have any uh, questions afterwards. Okay, capital revenue. Capital revenue is money that the library receives that was not in their normal budget to work on major projects. Major projects are we typically think of as being building projects, either a new building or an addition or expansion to a building or a major renovation or fixing the HVAC or adding an elevator or putting in a roof or something like that. And that those are the normal ones. But additionally, um, if any, if there's, you know, you have to get an ILS system or some other, you're replacing all your computers or you get a server and this is money that is not in your traditional normal year to year budget, but that has been allocated um, from somewhere to do this thing, it would go under capital revenue. Capital revenue is broken into local government revenue, so your municipality or, or municipalities, state government capital revenue, which is you got from the state, federal, again, same, and then other capital revenue, which is basically usually typically donations, but anywhere else that you were somehow getting money for the capital revenue. Um, so this right now, this is just asking about revenue. This is about asking about money that comes in for a project. Um, we'll ask about uh, expenses uh, a little later. So um, the money can be coming in, but um, even if the project is ongoing and you haven't done it, you still want to know the money is coming in. So that's capital revenue. It's frequently, the, most people are not doing that on a, on a regular basis, but then every once in a while, you have this big project, and you are doing, uh, you are getting capital revenue for it. Any questions on that? Please let me know. That's uh, the end of capital revenue. Now we are on to operating expenditures. Um, okay, so this is the second major piece of finances. This should cover basically every dollar that is spent by the library it should be in one of these categories. All the money that is outgoing from the library. So. There are a few categories. We start off with collections. It wants to know how much money you're spending on collections. Um, if you're able to break it down to print and electronic, um, that's great. Uh, oh, print, sorry, print, electronic, and then other, other being audio, video, any other group, things like that. So um, if you're spending money on RV Digital or Listen Up Vermont, those go are there electronic. If you have a database that you are paying for separately, not from an online library, but when you're paying for it, that would go in there. Um, print is everything that's print, um, and then audio video. If you if you just have a collections number and you can't break it down, that's fine too. Just pick the one that says we don't uh, we can't break it down. Put it in here, and that's fine. Um, okay, so that's thing number number one. We did collections expenditures. Uh, Another large category is employee expenditures. So. What we want here is we want salaries and benefits. Ideally, if you can break and separate those, that's great. If you can't, then just one lump that covers um, that covers salary and benefits. It is this is important to remember that um, in some cases, from some municipal libraries, they may, the employees may be paid uh, separately from the budget. It doesn't go into the budget. The town pays for it as though they're just a town staff member and you guys sort of don't ever see it. It still needs to be in there. We need to know that that is being, um, that that's being covered um, and that the town is paying for that. So if you have questions about that, if you're in a weird spot or something like that, get in touch. We'll figure out what the situation is. But that is staffing. So those are, cir cir I mean, um, yes, collection expenditures and staffing are two of the big ones. Next, we have one of those catch-all ones, other operating expenses. So that they list building maintenance or repair, debt service, heat, insurance, professional services, programming costs, service contracts, supplies, utilities. So this is sort of an everything else category. Um, and that covers a lot of ground. So uh, everything else that you're spending, uh, in many cases, goes here. Oh, um, I'll show you what it looks like when you ask if you wanted more information. You go and you click this one right here. You click on the button that says help for question. And then it gives you a little bit more information about how this question works. Um, again, it'll look different in the new portal, but it'll be effectively the same thing. I'm going to click show last year's answers as well. 
um, uh, now on. That'll show us what we answered last year. Uh, this is a test account, so it's not going to have real data. But OK, other operating expenditures we just got. Next, grant projects. So we want to know everything that you spent on grant projects. Typically, this is this should roughly equal the amount that in fact should exactly equal the amount that you got received in grants. So um, the grant projects are uh, on our base. If you're involved in the courier project and you receive a grant for that, that would be one thing. If you um, used uh, for summer uh, summer programming uh, uh, performer grants, these would come in here as well. Anything else that you spent money on as a grant is going to come into this category. So uh, that's how that works. And okay, so we talked about this before. Uh, this is the other end of capital. If you spent money, capital expenditures on any of those big ticket items we talked about earlier, um, expansions and remodeling and HVAC systems and elevators and all that super fun stuff, um, or an ILS <coughs> or computers or something like that. If you have expenditures, you want to put them here. If you didn't, you can leave that blank. Uh, reconciliation. This is basically just going to add up the numbers that are shown in um, that you that you put in um, income and expenditures, and it's going to tell you whether it thinks they add up roughly or not. Ideally, they should add up ballpark-ish. That's you know it's a good goal. But um, sometimes there's something um, that we didn't a lot or otherwise deal with. So we'll figure that out. If you have questions, if you get the, re the reconciliation section, it doesn't seem to be adding up the way that you think it should be. Uh, give me a holler, and we can figure out what um, what's wrong. But uh, yeah, so that is it for operating expenditures. Any questions on operating expenditures? All right. So let's jump ahead. Okay, holdings. This one is um, this is I mean this is definitely one of those numbers that libraries can. Um, okay, so this is just asking for your collection um, that, that you have, uh, basically across the board. So we start with print materials. Um, uh, so this is um, books, basically uh, other non-serial printed publications. So books, um, uh, they want to know, ideally, if you can break it into adult and children, that's great. If you can't, if you just have sort of a lump number for whatever reason, that's fine too. We'll take that number as well. Um, or if you don't have any idea what's in your collection uh, for whatever reason, you can put that as well. Question was asked last time: What do we do with young adult books? So, uh, uh, based on some discussion, uh, the age listed in here is that adult is covering everything 14 and up, and since that covers more of the YA uh, period, time period, age range. Um, our suggestion is if you have YA books broken out separately, put them under adults. It's not perfect, but it's more right. Um, we're going to look into whether we can add a YA category uh, in the future. IMLS doesn't currently ask for a YA category under holdings, um, but it's a, it seems like it would be a good thing to have. So we'd like to add it. We're not going to add it this time around. Um, so if you have YA stuff, YA stuff come under adult for now. Um, all right, and so. Um, I'm going to, just as a brief aside, um, a lot of the non-financial numbers in here, um, holdings and CERT, basically, you should be able to get from your ILS, um, if, if you have an ILS, um, and you're automated. So in general, if you have an ILS, you've probably been doing it year to year, so you may have a report that you're used to, but if it's new to you, um, and you're part of one of the consortiums, uh, like Catamount um, or Vocal uh, especially, um, there are there's probably there are a number of reports probably that are in there that basically just do this just are labeled annual report um, report uh, and so you want to make sure that if they're if you're in the consortium or environment where other people are using that it make sure and see if there is an easy one to use because it should give you all the things you don't have to use 15 different reports it'll just spit it out um, in general uh, I will say those reports tend to be really uh, intensive on the system so they like, like people do it after hours. But see if there's one there. If you're in, a, uh, in something that's not a consortium, but that a lot of people are using, ask around. See if other people have uh, know what reporting um, works, because they're, hopefully you can get it in a fairly straight, 
straightforward way. It'll just spit out all the data for the time period you want, and you don't have to do 15 different reports. OK, so that was my iOS spiel. Um, thank you for that. OK, uh, so we did holdings for print. Now we're going to do holdings for electronic books. This is the thing I mentioned before that is changing. So we want to know what your holdings are. If you have Listen Up Vermont, we want to know what your holdings are for Listen Up Vermont. If you have RB Digital, same thing. And, um, you should get that in the mail. If you have your own electronic books that you were disseminating in some other fashion um, that are checked out, um, then we want those there as well. Um, in general, and this is just a little aside, for Listen Up Vermont, uh, everybody, there's sort of a standard holding number that will figure out what that is. But if you use Overdrive Advantage, which a lot of people do to, um, to buy specific titles for their individual libraries, then your numbers will be slightly different. But in any case, we'll, we'll help you get those numbers if you are not getting them already. But we want to know everything that you have on ebooks that get checked out um, and downloaded. Next, video items. OK, these are, we jump back to physical items. So these are physical video items, DVDs, and VHS, and Blu-ray. And if you have video playaways or something else like that, physical video items that you're lending out. This is where we want the numbers. Again, if you can do adult and children separately, that's great. If you can't and it's just a lump sum, that's fine too. Okay, uh, last but not least, downloadable video items. So uh, increasingly, this, this is a question that a few years ago was nobody uh, by and large people didn't have, but increasingly there are more libraries for using uh, Canopy and Hoopla and things like that. So what we, we want to know is how many items are in the catalog that people are able to uh, check out. Uh, probably there's some stats that you're getting from your, your vendor on that, and it should be a pretty straightforward number. But if you have questions about that, obviously let us know. And if, um, I will say, in general, if your answer is uh, none for anything, or in many cases, or you are unable to capture that number. Uh, in general, a zero is probably the best bet. There are a few spots where it wants um, uh, not uh, a not applicable, but in general, a zero is almost always the right answer. If the answer is we don't do that, or we don't know how many we have because we don't have that stack. Okay, we're continuing to move through holdings. Uh, physical audio items. This includes. Music and audiobooks, um, any kind. So, um, playaways, um, physical audiobooks, MP3 audiobooks, anything that's physically going out, um, audio CDs, anything in that range. If you have LPs that are lent, that would count as well. If you have audio cassettes or eight tracks, then I kind of want to hear the story, but those count as well. Um, so, anything in that range. Again, if you can break them into audio and children. That's uh, great. If not, that's fine too. Uh, next, downloadable audio items. They work the same as ebooks. So if you, um, it's your Listen Up Vermont and RB Digital, whatever, those all count. We just want to know what number you have in there. Um, and uh, it, regardless of, like I said, this used to have this instruction about do you select individual items, are they in your catalog, things like that. We don't, that's confusing and not helpful, so we're not going to use that anymore. But basically, we want to know how many downloadable audio items you have. Next, um, print magazines and newspapers, uh, any other serial thing that you're getting, basically. Um, we just want to know how many you have that you're getting on a regular basis, whatever a regular basis is. If you can break them into adult children, great. If you can't, that's fine, too. OK, here's one that used to be somewhat complicated that we're trying to make easier. Um, electronic databases. Um, basically, for public libraries, and I should have said that before, um, I don't think I actually verbalized that before. The, this annual report is for public libraries. Academic libraries um, do their own reporting, but it doesn't come to, through us this way. And academic libraries do their own thing as well. It's only public libraries. But, so for electronic databases, we offer public libraries. Um, they all get Vermont Online Library, Heritage Quest, and Universal Class. And nobody's paying for that. It gets disseminated. Everyone has it. So you don't need to count that anymore. We're just going to include that. So basically, all you're going to do is say if you have any other databases, um, and there are there are a couple options that are kind of, that might be through us, or that you might have independently. You might have EBSCO. You might have uh, sort of career training, additional career training stuff. You might have Mango. 
anything like that, if you have something else, we want it here. But if it's one of the ones that we provide, we already know about it, so don't include it. And the instructions will say that. These instructions aren't the old ones. They don't say that. But going forward, you'll just have to tell us what additional stuff you have. Um, and hopefully, uh, that will keep all of our numbers correct. Um, so there's that. Databases. Going to the next one. Da, da, da. OK. And this is just the end of that. Um, so services. This is one of the longest categories. So um, they, you know, this is kind of an, and everything else that you do as a library. So uh, it kind of jumps around a little bit. But um, oh, so sorry, I didn't um, give people a chance. Any questions on holdings? I know holdings is also a fairly large category and is one that you know is, is sort of a core one of our core uh, aspects. So um, okay, so uh, services. Again, this is the everything else you do as a library category. So, um, OK. First off, how many registered borrowers do you have? Um, and again, if you can break them into adult and children, that's great. Um, and uh, Or if it's just a lump sum, that's fine. We want to know how many you have in total. Um, oh, this is a good point, and I should have said this earlier. So in general, the, all of these reporting questions are talking about the reporting period, the period that you're reporting on. So whatever the last fiscal year that you were talking, telling us about, we want to know all these numbers based on that time frame. Um, so uh, if you know if your uh, reporting year ended uh, June 30th, we want to know how many registered borrowers you have as of June 30th, if it's possible to capture that number. That is the ideal. Um, in some cases, you know you. You, you don't have that, that number, you, you don't have it for whatever. But ideally, we want all the numbers from the uh, reporting period. Frequently, the last, the end of the reporting period is, is the most coherent time to do it, or consistent. But that's what we want. So things like how many books you have, holdings, for example, all holdings we want, ideally, from the end of your reporting period. Obviously, if, you, if for some reason that didn't happen, and you have to give it to us now, it's not the end of the world. But in an ideal world, that's what we would be getting. OK, registered borrowers, adults and children. Um, this is across the board. Um, so we got registered borrowers. Next, <clears throat> visits. Um, and I believe this is one of the ones that asked. There are a bunch of in a week questions that we've changed to in a year. Um, so how many people visit, visit the library? If you have um, you know, a people counter at the front door, this is easy. If you don't have a people counter, then it depends on what structure you use to capture things like that. If you, if you just have a tally mark or something like that. Um, for things, this is going to be the first one, but there are other ones down the line. Uh, for things that maybe some libraries don't capture all the time, things like visits, Wi-Fi usage, reference transactions, what you can absolutely do is do a uh, sort of a, just a uh, survey period. You just pick a period. Um, during the year that you think is indicative of your averages, and you just say, okay, this for the next two weeks or next week or whatever, I am going to count how many people come in the building, or I'm going to count how many reference transactions we do, or I'm going to count whatever. Um, so if there are things that you are not capturing during the year for, for the full year, but that it asks about, if you want to do it for a period, and we want to, ideally, don't pick your most busy period, don't pick your slowest period. If you want to, like, pick an average period or pick a couple times and average them together, that's fine. Um, so whichever, whatever you're doing, whatever your internal sort of um, uh, stat keeping strategy is, that's fine. If you, if you kept, you know, capture it for the whole year, that's great. If you just capture it for a couple of weeks here and there, that's fine too. Whatever works for you is, is good with us. Um, OK, so I did visits. Visits is everybody coming into the building, no matter why they're coming into the building. We just want to know that they come into the building. Next, reference transactions. Um, so this is the same thing, and this is something that people don't always aren't always great at capturing because you're so busy, and because when you do capture reference questions, people who do it regularly, frequently you'll get to the end of the day and you'll say, "Oh, I forgot to write down. I have like ten more than that, and I didn't get captured." So that's the thing, and we know that's hard. So that's a that's definitely one that you could do as a survey. Just say, oh, we're going to do a week. We're going to do reference questions. We're going to track them. 
Um, and that's great. That's fine with us. We just whatever number you're going to get is fine. Um, is, however you're capturing it is fine with us. Um, the more the more you're capturing it, the better. Obviously, we we have all, we have more libraries than we have one like that don't answer this question, and that's the thing that we're going to work on as we go forward. Um, okay, so a question came up before. What is a reference question? Because it's easy to have a kind of specific narrow um, idea in mind when you say a reference question. I asked our um, reference librarian, April Shaw, to give me her answer. Her answer was, quote, um, the general guideline is any question that imparts knowledge to a person and teaches them something they didn't know. Anything where the librarian looks up the answer or refers them to another person who would have the answer or even gives them directions to another location. So what does that mean? Roughly speaking, it includes any question beyond where is the bathroom and when is my book due. That tends to be a broader definition than people are using, but that's what we want to, you know, if you have to look it up, if you have to figure it out, if you have to, they want to know what the next book in the series is, that's absolutely a reference question. They want to know how to get to the lawn room map, that's a reference question. So you can use whatever working definition your library wants, but that's, um, that's some suggestions that we have um, from, uh, from the department. In general, being more inclusive rather than exclusive in what to reference transactions. Okay, so that was reference. Next, annual circulation of all media. Uh, this is written slightly confusingly because the first question is actually electronic media. So we want to know how many uh, circs you've had for um, downloadable items, basically, is what it means. And this is a number that you should be, if you are going to be digital, you should be getting um, from us. And if Listen Up Vermont, it should be in your Listen Up Vermont stats. If you know how to get access to them already, that's good. If you don't, we can kind of um, go between the uh, GMLC and get you to those numbers. Um, but that, that just tells you how many times they're going out, which is great, and increasingly a more and more important number, obviously. Um, OK, next. All right, electronic information retrieval. So what does this mean? This means electronic databases. So for us, it means from our online library, and it means um, heritage trust. And so in both those cases, um, you uh, there is, there's a way that you can log in and find your stats. A lot of people have that. If you don't have that and you would like that, come talk to me. Um, and I can tell you how to log in. It's pretty straightforward. And you can figure out how often VOL and um, heritage trust are being used. Um, if you have a problem, uh, I can always just look up your stats. So, Say, say, I don't know how to do it, and I'm a little busy right now. So let me know, and I can look up electronic um, retrieval. Um, universal class, unfortunately, um, the way it's structured, um, because the way that um, we're using the consortium setting, does not break it out by library. Unfortunately, it just has, once patrons are um, put in the system, it doesn't know what library they're associated with. So it can't tell us how often things are used. We, we're, bugging, um, we're bugging them to restructure that, but as of yet, it has not worked. So you don't need to worry about inverse class numbers. However, if you use any other databases, Mango, EBSCO, um, career stuff, anything else, we would like you to get those numbers as well. So log in and get your stats. It should be pretty straightforward. Uh, but if you have a question about it, let us know. So that's that. All right, circulation of um, adult and children physical items. So this is just normal survey numbers. Um, again, if you can break it out by adult and children, that's great. If you can't, you can just use one lump sum. And if you don't have any certain numbers at all, for whatever reason, you don't have to write that in. Um, again, young adult per CERC should also, uh, we, we suggest putting it under adult because it covers more of the time period because it's defined as 14 and not adult in the system. And again, that's the thing that we might add down the line just so we get a better handle on how often people's YA collections are going out. But, so that's CERC, that's another thing that should hopefully be easily, uh, easy to grab from your ILS. Okay, uh, inter uh, ILLs, interlibrary loans. Um, we want to know um, how many you've provided and how many you've received uh, during the year. And that's the number that we're looking for. Um, uh, fairly straightforward. It, this number is asking, we are not asking about in-state, ever, anywhere, wherever it's going. We want to know if you provided it and wherever it came from. We want to know that you received it. And that's the number that we're looking for right there. So that is ILS. 
Okay. Programming. All right. So, programming is pretty straightforward. Um, okay. So first off, we want to know how many programs you've had. Um, ideally, you can break them into adult, children, and young adult programs. Um, this is the one spot where they do ask about young adult. I'm not sure why, but um, so uh, and the question is not who is attending the program, but who the program was intended for. You can kind of know going ahead in. Is it an adult program? Maybe we had a bunch of teens there, but it's an adult program. Or it's a YA program and a couple of adults attended, which can be awkward. But in any case, um, that's, you know what kind of program it was. So whichever category, one program is, is here. A few questions that come up with programs. Um, first off, what if no one comes? Um, so. And it, we, there's been lots of discussion, and the, the, but our, our sense is that if you do the work to make a program happen and nobody appears, it's still a program. And I've definitely been there. I've had maybe more than my share of programs that have no zero attendance, but it's still you still put in all the work, you still do the legwork, you still you could do the program in the future. It's it still counts. Um, so that's question one. Uh, question two is what makes um, is a passive program count? And that depends. Um, we sort of, there's sort of a continuum of passive programming. There's, oh, we put out a coloring sheet and something and someone did it. Or we just, people looked at a handout or something like that. We're looking for programs that had a little bit of work on your end and a little bit of interaction on their end. So those would tend to probably not count. But some um, some programming, there's like, you know, contests where people were suggesting things and then something else happens because of it. For example, a um, uh, library I was at, there's a gingerbread contest and people make gingerbread houses um, and efforts, not exactly passive, but then people vote on it and then vote on it and then there's feedback. So I had always construed that as that is a program, even though by and large people are doing it without necessarily our interaction. The question is how much work you're putting into it and how much, whether the patrons are doing something. That's sort of the divine line. If you ever have a question about whether a passive program counts or not, um, use your judgment or are talking to you. But it's basically, that's sort of our dividing line. Uh, another question about programming that came up last time is um, the uh, programs that are held in our your building but are not library programs. This starts to get a little bit nebulous again. And it's sort of a question of do you how much ownership you feel about it? How much if you put how much work you've done? Setting up and take breaking down does not count as work in this context, unfortunately. Um, because that's sort of it's our mandate to provide a public space. So if you're just providing a public space for a program, it's there, has nothing to do with you, that does not count. But uh, I think many libraries have programs that are regularly put on that are sort of effectively in a sense feel like library adjacent programs um, that that you're not running. Like uh, book clubs, they always meet in the library, but that you guys don't run. Or um, uh, you know, uh, any other like hobby thing, game nights, things like that, that you guys aren't running, but that you were doing some work on. You were promoting it, you were talking it up, you were doing something else. And so it might not be your program, but you were putting work into it. And that's sort of, the, for me, that is the dividing line. Um, if you were not putting and again, work does not count as sitting on tables or chairs, unfortunately, really. But if you see the kind of think of it as a semi-library program that you guys are just not running, a program that ends up on your calendar, a program you're telling people about, then I think that counts in this category as programming. If you're not doing those things, it probably doesn't count. But if you have a question, feel free to ask me or ask the group or what have you. So we want to know how many programs you have for adults. Uh, young adult and children, or children and young adults, I guess is the order. Um, next, how many of the programs were sponsored or collaboration with another organization or agency? Um, I think we see that uh, that's a big thing, and we certainly like to see that more in the future. But if there's another organization that you're working with, definitely count them there because people uh, really like to see collaboration. Okay, so the first question is how many programs did you do? Second is attendance. It's broken down the same way. It's um, adult, children, young adult, um, and you're counting how many people attend any part of the program. Um, that's all. That should be fairly straightforward. 
Okay, next, annual outreach services. Outreach in this context means a fairly narrow thing. It means, um, it has traditionally meant how many deliveries you made to one of these things, of deliveries of books. We brought books to somebody's house. We brought books to a child care provider or a child care center or a school. Or we brought books to somewhere else. Um, those are the three categories. Traditionally, this has sort of meant um, we brought books from our collection, they went there, later we brought some back, we would kind of exchange. But we discussed it in-house, and in fact, some people might have already been using this definition, but uh, a lot of people bring donated books to schools, food shelves, um, little free libraries, things like that, with the intention that the books are not coming back, they're just going away. Um, we would definitely like to count these under outreach. Um, Outreach is a question. This is a question that we're asking, not that IMLS is asking, so we have some flexibility over it. So basically, if you're doing any of those things, every time you do it, we would like you to count that as outreach. Um, most of those are going to be uh, the, the third category, other sites. But if you're bringing, you know, anywhere that you're bringing books like that, um, where they will, you know, where they will get disseminated, we want to know about that. So, uh, so that's a little bit new for this year. Like I said, people might have been already doing this on their own, but we'd like to officially do that. It's, it's not necessarily going to say that in the instructions because this came up after the instructions were submitted. But Okay, so that is outreach. Um, next, we have, okay, computer services. Um, there's some sort of nitty gritty questions about public computers. So the first one is not about public computers, it's how many computer workstations do you have in the building, staff or public? So anything that's in there in the building all the time, we'd like to know that, first off. Secondly, how many, of those, how many are available for public access? Um, so this means either, um, either always available, you know, desktops that you have set up for the public, or laptops that are available um, by request, or anything, anything that the public is going to be predominantly using. This is the number one there. Uh, next, we want to know how old those public access computers are, whatever kind they are. Um, and um, just and sort of, you know, if you might not have that uh, number super available, but just sort of ballpark it. Um, we want to know how old things are. Um, as probably you do too. If you ever have trouble, you have a model and you have trouble figuring out, oh, we have a we have a Dell 99. How old is that? I don't know. We don't have I don't have that record right in front of me. Uh, one thing you can do frequently is if you Google it, Dell 99, you can find it. You can often find when people were writing reviews of the Dell 99, and um, and then you can usually have data on it, so you can figure out what they came from. That's just if, if you're otherwise, if you have trouble, um, sort of ballpark it or give me a holler. Okay, so uh, continuing computer questions: How many people um, were trained formally, and both library staff and the general public were trained? Formally and informally in the year to use your library's computers. Sort of a weird question, I recognize, but um, so we have constructed. So basically, if you provide, if you did training, either formally, if you did a class, or informally, um, this is another thing that, that's like the reference uh, question that, that, that probably happens all the time, but people don't have time to report it. Uh, so, um, but generally, if you can kind of uh, get an answer for that, and also it includes staff. So if staff has trainings that you were doing. You know, we do an in-service where they get to learn VOL or something like that, or they learn how the IOS is doing. That's the number we're looking for. Um, okay, so let's train. Next, um, how many people use the library uh, public computers to access the internet? You don't need to know what they're specifically doing on it. They're just doing word. They're using the computer. That's the question. And how many people are doing that? If you have one of the automated pieces of uh, software that sort of manages computer use, um, that's great. That'll just give you the answer. You won't have to do anything. Um, everybody else manages it somehow. It might be a piece of paper. It might be a, depending on how many people you have um, or something. But there should be some mechanism where you're figuring out how many uh, patrons are using their computers um, over time. And um, I think this is another question that originally asked in a week, but we wanted it in a year. If you do a survey, that's fine. And you just Figuring out, multiply it by how many, um, by 52 weeks or what have you, and that'll come up with your annual number. Okay, so that's people using the computers. Next, 
do you offer a Wi-Fi connection? Yes or no? Increasingly, there's a lot of yeses, but there are still some libraries um, who don't have that available. So um, yes or no. The next one, and one that is hard, is if you do, um, how many wireless sessions uh, have you had over a uh, time, uh, time period? I think this is another one that was a week and it's changed over here. But OK, so some people, uh, if you're using certain Wi-Fi systems, um, this answer is really easy. If you're on Fiber Connect, it should be easy. If you use um, uh, Meraki or one of the other sort of, there's a, um, so you're paying a subscription to have a service that handles, that sort of covers your Wi-Fi, it will have those numbers available. And you just, boom, you'll just have them. And that's great, but it's not free. Um, so that's the thing. Uh, if you're not in that case, this can be a hard number to capture. There are a couple ways to do it. Um, and this is a good one, if you're not capturing it regularly, this is a good one to do a survey, to do a week or something somewhere that you think is average. Um, that you can capture it by logging into your Wi-Fi access point. It's fiddly usually. It involves you can see how many um, how many uh, uh, sessions you have in some cases, or how many people have a uh, um, have a lease on it. It's a little bit. It can be a little bit challenging. I'm not going to lie. This is one that is a relatively recent add to the test. So um, there are other can be other ways to do it. None of them are. Absolutely straightforward, unfortunately. Um, so if you have questions about how to capture Wi-Fi numbers, please get in touch with me. It's a thing that maybe we will talk about. Uh, we will talk. We will be talking about in the future because it's a number that people should have, but it can be hard to get. Uh, we'll try to give some strategies on that. I don't want to go on a whole tangent on it, but um, it's something that is definitely worth talking about. Again, we want your best effort. But at the end of the day, if you cannot get this number, don't like, don't sweat it, don't stress. Just time around, put a zero in, and we'll, we'll work on it again. We'll try again for next time. Um, okay, so that question is how many Wi-Fi sessions? Um, well, right in here, we're also going to have the website question that I mentioned earlier. Same situation. Um, hopefully, you should be able to get into your your website and figure out how many. And the question is, if they're looking for a token, uh, we want. Um, the question on our website is visits. There are a bunch of different um, mechanic uh, numbers, stats for websites. The one we want is how many visits did you get? Um, so, uh, so again, oh, you may be able to get in. Maybe you're not sure how. It's definitely not a super intuitive thing all the time. So. That's a thing we'll work on, and if we don't have numbers for everybody this year, then it's not going to be So, um, OK, so that is um, that is that first one. Uh, that is uh, Wi-Fi, and then we talked about the website one. Uh, if your library has access to the internet, what kind of uh, service do you have? Uh, this is just a sort of ballpark on what, what uh, how fast your service is. is it, are you getting it from cable modem? Are you getting it from DSL? Are you getting fiber network, et cetera? Um, the next question is much different than it looks like. If your library has public internet access, is it filtered? And what this means is something very specific. It means, are you filtering out, or do you have the software on the computers to filter out adult content? This is predominantly done, this might be a library's decision to do it, but it's predominantly done for libraries who uh, participate in E-rate funding. And not through Fiber Connect, but are doing it on their own. Uh, there's a mandate that you have to run filtering on all of the computers in your building. So that's it's asking if you're running. It doesn't. It's not. It doesn't care if you have a firewall or antivirus or anything. It's only asking if you're running something that um, that tries to block out adults' uh, content. Um, if you're running it on any computers, we'd like to know about it. Um, any or all. If you just are running it on just computers. That's something some people folks do. Uh, Net nanny, something like that. If you're running something like that, that's what goes here. Otherwise, nothing goes there. Um, next one is, do you have an ILS system? And if so, what is it? Obviously, I just sent an email asking about this um, to try to get everybody up to date, uh, or get everybody's information up to date. Uh, this is a question that doesn't always get fielded in the report. And I don't know that the report is necessarily the right place for it. Um, but you'll be writing the same thing in there. Um, OK. 
So right after that, that was services, there are a series of questions that are just yes, no questions. Did you offer any of these for patrons who need help using computers and digital services uh, or digital resources? Uh, and you just say yes or no. One-on-one uh, -on -one assistance, uh, job hunt help, et cetera. OK. So we finished that. Um, I'm just going to run through the rest because the rest is really short, and then we can work on questions. OK. So you've done that. You've fin finished the, the great uh, uh, predominance of the, the report is finished now. You're just sort of wrapping up. So one thing you do is um, it asks you what successes you've had this year and what's new at your library. And I understand that at this point you're very sick of looking at the report, but we would love anything that you um, that you can put in there. We, um, we find it super helpful, and it sometimes tells us things that we don't know happened, which is our, our bad and not yours, but we, we love to hear whatever time you can put into that. Then you tell us uh, who filled out the report, because obviously it's always, not always the director. It's not always the director who was on record, because there may have been transition in between. Your title and position and the date. Um, there's this note about standards. Um, so you don't need to really worry about standards at the moment. Standards is something we are working on an updated standards. Um, so that'll become applicable then. Um, OK, so you've done that. Then, I believe you. You can do it. Okay. Uh, this is census questions. These don't. You don't need to touch them. Leave them alone. Okay. This is where you certify that you are happy with all the information. Um, you uh, librarian puts their name in, dates it. Chairperson of the board of trustees puts their name in, dates it. You hit um, next, and then okay. So. You have gotten to the end of the report. Um, the next thing it's going to ask you to do is edit checks. Everyone loves edit checks. So what are edit checks? Edit checks are when the computer thinks that your last year's number and this year's number are really different. And it thinks something maybe it's wrong. Um, like, uh, the, like your cert numbers have changed dramatically. Your programming numbers have changed dramatically. The computer, it's automatic. It's not smart. It will pick up on things, and you might say, oh, that's a tiny, you know, oh, we went from uh, three YA programs to five YA programs. The computer is probably going to flag it because it's percentage-wise and significant. So it may flag things that don't make any sense, and we'll just work on it. But so what will happen is you'll get to the end. You will click on status. Status is going to give you everything that it wants you to do an edit check on. And it's going to tell you the question. It's going to give you your answer. It's going to give you your last year's answer. And then it's going to tell you why the answer is weird, typically because it's different from last year, or possibly because it, you, you put it in a format that it doesn't like. You put an NA and want zero or the reverse. It will always, um, what it wants is a note. It wants you to give a note. And it's going to tell you where to put it. There, over here on the side, you can put a note in the federal field, the state field, or the local field. And it's going to tell you which one. It's going to say, use the federal note. And frequently, the federal note is the one. But sometimes it will ask for the state or local note. So what you're going to put is, you're just going to explain it, um, why, is, why that difference is taking place. Um, oh, we are, you know, we were closed for a chunk of the year. Or we have renovations or something. So our numbers are all down. Or, Oh, our children's librarian was, was gone for six months, so our children's numbers are, are down. Or, oh, we, we did a bunch more programming, and that's why the programming numbers are better. Or whatever. We, it's just, it just wants an explanation. Um, and then what you're going to do when you've gotten all the expon ex, uh, explanations is say, submit corrections. And then it's going to give you a, I don't know have one, a green checkbox if it likes what you gave. And what that means is basically you put it in the right field. It generally it doesn't really care as long as you put it in the right field. Um, it'll give you an X if you put it in the wrong field, and that's easy to do. Um, but uh, once you get all green checkboxes, that means you are set, and you can submit it, and then you are good to go, and the report is submitted. And you're done. So um, that's, let's see, that's a lot. Um, uh, okay, I've 
thrown a whole bunch at you. I'm going to, let's see. How about, no, I'm going to go back and then we're going to have questions. Is that okay? So I'm going to go back to the end of the, the um, end of the uh, PowerPoint, because there's a few different points at the end, uh, towards the end of that that I think are worth making. Okay. What happens after you submit? If anybody's curious, okay, you do all the edit checks, you submit the form. I run around and make sure that everybody, who uh, everybody, all the libraries have submitted. Once we get everything and we have our hard deadline, I uh, submit the information to the IMLS portal. And then it comes back and tells me every field that it doesn't like, that where it doesn't make sense or it does, it's not in the format that it likes or so on. And so I make a bunch of edits and then it comes back and tells me and then I make a bunch of edits. So it's a process, it's back and forth. And then eventually we get it where it's happy, it has an explanation for everything that's in there, or I like put zeros where it wanted zeros instead of an ace or whatever. Uh, and then I know a lot of staff go through it one last time and figure out if there's any, anything weird enough that they really want an answer. They're like, what is going on here? Um, I answer it. They're happy with it. The state librarian certifies the form, and we're complete. That's all. And that is the end of the process. Um, all right, so I've said an enormous amount of things, and I've run through this pretty fast, actually. I, I apologize. I hope it wasn't too fast. I felt like the last time around I was going um, I was going a little slow, and I got on more tangents. So I tried to kind of um, slam through this one fairly quickly. But questions. Who has questions? Who has things that either didn't make sense? or outlier cases that they want to know what they should do. Um, I have a series of questions that I um, that came up last time that I, in most cases, didn't have answers for. Um, a lot of them I've shared with you already. But um, if I don't have any questions, I'm just going to mention a couple of them because they are probably things that will come up. And then we're good. But anybody? Any uh, questions? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through a couple of these. You guys keep thinking of questions you might have. Um, let's just make sure that I'm okay. So, in general, if you have uh, if you have didn't do anything, uh, didn't do something at all, a category, or you don't have the staff for it, go with zero. Um, there are a couple that I might force you to do any, but zero is usually the best bet. Um, somebody asked last time. Uh, there are spots for um, sort of regular staff, but what about subs or non-regular staff hours, bookmobile hours, seasonal hours, things like that? Um, we might look into it for next time around, so it's a little bit more um, constructive because it kind of assumes that you have a weekly schedule and it just multiplies it by 52. Um, what we, what you're welcome to do if you want to is add up any hours for seasonal staff or sub staff or anything like that, um, and then divide them by 52, and then add it to all other staff. And so that might end up being a weird like decimal point, but that's uh, that's probably the most accurate way to do it, if you'd like. Um, so that's an option. Um, let's see. Um, OK. Uh, restricted gifts. Oh, so again, if you get restricted gifts, um, there's some uh, uncertainty about what IMLS is looking for in that. Our previous forms have suggested restricted gifts do not get included at all. You just don't mention them. Um, so that's we're going to continue doing that for this year if you have any restricted gifts. If money, if people give you um, money is donated to the, directly to the endowment or savings account or any of those other things that are not, um, that doesn't get included either. Um, let's see. Questions. Um, yeah, so that's I think it. I'm gonna um, I'm working on a page, an annual report page, a sort of submitting the annual report page on the website, and that has all the questions that I've answered so far. Um, so once that's done, I'm gonna send that out to everybody, and they can have it. It'll also have this PowerPoint if anybody's interested in the PowerPoint, um, or I can send it to you through um, everybody who participated today. Um, and uh, again, so the dates um, are. Let's go back to dates. This time around are, oops, 
states the uh, the portal should be opening on November 1st this time, um, and the due date is December 31st, 2018. But if you want an extension, all you have to do to get it is ask, email me or call me or whatever, and you can have an extension until January 14th, no questions asked. However, that's going to be our hard deadline this time around um, as we get things uh, submitted. So there's that. Uh, again, if you end up with, um, oh, so when we uh, when we get closer to the live date, um, or maybe just as we hit the live date, we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to give you information about the new portal because, like I said, it looks different, it's a little bit different. We're going to get people up to speed on that. That is going to be a pretty brief, either a brief webinar and slash video, or just an email. Um, as you're doing, uh, as you're working on the report, again, I said this before, but I just want to reiterate: if you have questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Please. Don't feel like, um, I know it's a ton of work and I know you guys are busy, but don't feel like you should just like soldier on on your own if you're hitting a wall, doing anything weird. Um, one, uh, one specific thing, if you get, if for some reason, like you didn't report last year or something changed where a whole bunch of your numbers are going to be different, um, let me know and because you, you might get edit checks on every single thing. If you're, if you're in a case like that or something, let me know. I'll figure it out. You don't need to spend like all the time on that. I'll we'll, we'll resolve it. But in short, if you have any, when you get questions about anything, um, let me know. If you have, if you're one of the libraries who's on a sort of a weird calendar at this point, or uh, it was off schedule, I will get in touch with you and we'll figure out what we're going to do. I think the answer is we're just going to keep doing what we're doing for the time being. And um, any um, last chance for any questions about the annual report? All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate all the time that you've uh, you've uh, taken to sharing with me. This is this is great. Um, I really I know the report is a uh, is a bit of a bear, so I appreciate everybody's um, you know all the prep that anybody can do and anything that I can do. To help, oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for thanks for coming, um, Carson and Diana. Really appreciate it. Thanks to everyone who uh, who came to this. And let me um, let's just make sure I'm, gonna, I'm capturing everybody uh, briefly. Okay, so we got that. Okay, so that's uh, that. And thanks everybody. Uh, this is great. I uh, really appreciate it. And again, the biggest takeaway is if you have questions about it, um, just let me know. And that it's um, that it, it is it is a fair amount of work, but it's all this a step by step process. So, thank you very much. Everybody have a great uh, have a great rest of your day and a great week. And um, we're uh, you know, looking forward to talking to you sometime soon. So thanks a lot. Take care, everybody. I'm waving like there's a camera, but there isn't. So have a great week.